on September 2, 1945. Japanese Foreign Minister Mamuro Shigemutsu signed on behalf of the Japanese the surrender of Japan in World War II on the deck of the Missouri. However, Lieutenant Hiro Inoda famously did not surrender his post in the Philippines until March of 1974. This was an incredibly long standoff and the year is significant for the NFL and its players as well because 1974 marked the year where it really started a standoff that would end up transforming 20 years down the road into the modern era of free agency. These players had a theme back then, and it was no freedom, no football. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off our DeLorean, the date is March 13th, 2019, at 4 p.m. Eastern in all major NFL cities across the nation. No, wait a tick. When this episode launches, that's the future, right? I mean, we only had to jump a little bit into the future because we had to test out the flux capacitor and ratings because we didn't know if it was going to, you know, get to the point where it was going to get us to where we wanted to be. But why are we here? Why do we jump flash forward a little bit into the future? It's kind of like Cartman waiting for the Wii back in the South Park episode a long time ago. Well, I have two words for you. Free agency. Because if you're listening to this episode, when it launched, then today at 4 p.m., the contracts for the 2018 season expire for the players, and it is the Wild Wild West. And I ask you, are you anxiously waiting to see what your team is going to pick up in the free agency market? Who's that blue chip free agent you're going to get? Are you hoping that you can fortify with free agents and big money players, or do you want to build from within? Well, both methods have proven success in the NFL as well as failures. But often, it's a hybrid combination of free agency, the draft, and trades that develop a championship-caliber team. And if you're listening to this episode far into the future, beyond March 13th, 2019 at 4 p.m., well, you probably know what your team already did. You know who you picked up. I don't know how to figure out this whole space continuum, vortex, wormhole stuff, you know, going back and forth in time, but let's just not deal with that. Let's get back to the topic of why we are here. 2019 free agency. But aren't you curious to see how did we get to the 2019 free agency? Don't you want to know how it all began? What was it like at the beginning? Where was it going through the middle and how are we going to get to where we want to be? Well, let's take a look back, peel back the curtain to the very beginnings of NFL free agency. Well, the first stop on our DeLorean trip, it's not the beginning of the NFL because the first ever player to get paid, it was a long time ago. Back on November 12, 1892, William Pudge Heffelfinger was paid the sum of $500 to play a game. And you can learn more about the first paid professional football player on episode 2 of this show. And to make it easy on you, I left a link in the show notes, which you can get to through your podcast player or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, I ask that you subscribe for free to this show by mashing that little subscribe button on your podcast player of choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes each and every week. But let's get back to players getting paid, you know, free agency, the reason why we're here today. Beginning back in 1920, you know, that inaugural season, the NFL, well, let's just say players didn't get paid a whole lot. You know, they also had to take many jobs in the offseason or even in season. They had football might have been their third or fourth job, just their side hustle, not like it is today. And one reason for this? They had what they called the reserve rule. Basically, it was a clause that allowed the team to continue signing that same player for that same contract year after year after year, regardless of the performance they had on the field. They had no say in how they were going to negotiate a new contract deal or things of that nature. It was modeled like how baseball was, because baseball was around longer and it was definitely still more popular at the time. So it appeared that players had no control. If a player didn't work out a new deal, that team had the right to reserve and renew that contract for up to a 10% reduction. And if they didn't sign, they were put on what they called the reserve list. The, you know, sit down and shut up kind of list. Because basically, you are hands off for the other teams. 
The only way you're getting off this team is if we decide, and that is we, the owner, decide to trade you, we sell your contract, or you can do, you can go ahead and retire if you want. That's your decision. Or you're out in a box. and whoa, Not really a box. That's a, some of the mafia stuff back in Chicago around that time frame. Probably some of that stuff was going on, but let's just, that's a little too far for this uh, little family friendly podcast here. Let's just move forward to the change that went from the reserve rule in 1947 to what they called the one year option rule. This really didn't have a whole lot of changes as far as I go because it didn't really have that much of an impact, but it was a step in the right direction. With this one year option rule, teams had the right to exercise that reserve contract only one time after it expired. So, kind of. Technically, free agency begins, you know, where they get a chance after one year of accrued football playing and one contract, then you can go and go on your merry way, find another team if you want. It was more like, I dare you. I dare you to go do that. And no, no players really dared the system. They did not challenge it until R.C. Owens of the San Francisco 49ers decided to switch teams back in 1961. Well, it was really after the 1961 season when he was the first ever wide receiver in 49ers history to gain over 1,000 yards. So he had a little bit of a clout, and he had teams that wanted his services. So he left the 49ers for the Baltimore Colts for the 1962 season. Now this caused chaos and controversy amongst the league. The league owners, they were like, what's going on here? And it was said that the 49ers owner, Vic Morabito, refused to speak to Colts owner, Carol Rosenblum, ever again. You know, like, hey, you stole my parking lot, and I ain't gonna, I'm not talking to you anymore. You and I, are, you're dead to me. With owners and, you know, utter disbelief and disarray, and, you know, there was a lot of scrutinizing going around in the league. This was our next milestone, because in 1963, the then commissioner, Pete Rizal, he issued a new rule that was called the Rizal Rule. NFL owners and the NFLPA, they agreed to include this into the CBA that following year. But here's the deal. New teams, they sign players. They're supposed to agree with the old team on some kind of compensation package. You know, basically it's a trade. It's not really a free agent kind of deal. If they did not have an agreement, then Rozell gave himself the authority to step in and he would dish out whatever he felt was fair. From 1963 to 1974, I saw that only 34 players jumped ship. So just think about that. These owners, they did not think it was worth it. And probably one of the reasons was because there's an example from Rizal's rule that came up. The Saints were forced to give two first rounders for wide receiver Dave Parks. He only caught 26 passes the last the previous season for the 49ers. Recently, I mean last year we had a whole bunch of receivers and other players that got traded in the league. Now, two first rounders for a guy who basically was a second string bum, maybe and not at the time. He was 26 passes caught. I mean, the Raiders just traded for Antonio Brown, future Hall of Famer, considered one of the best, you know, to put on the helmet as far as the receiver goes. And they gave up, I think, like a third and a fifth rounder. So the owners did not feel that taking players from other teams was in their best interest. And players, they weren't too happy because that meant that they were pretty much stuck dealing with the current ownership that they had, and they knew that they had no bargaining chips. And although this was labeled free agency, it really was more a trade market amongst the owners. Because like I said, the players, they didn't have anything. They, They weren't able to leverage anything for themselves. So 1974, this is when things started to really heat up, and it was going to be a long standoff between the players and the NFL. Just like Lieutenant Hiro Onoda back in 1974 finally gave up his standoff. Now the NFL, they're going to take it over. Even though the NFL PA was in existence from 1956, they really didn't do a whole lot for the NFL players, but especially as far as free agency goes. So this was a major turning point. And the players, they all had a rally cry. It was, no freedom, no football. And these were their five most important demands. The first one, was the elimination of that option clause. You know, the Rizal rule. They didn't want to limit free agency. The second was they wanted impartial arbitration of all disputes. And to me, that, that's fair enough. You got to have somebody that has an impartial biasness towards it. Just give them the right to make the arbitration on the disputes. The third was they wanted elimination of the draft. So I'm, I'm thinking, what, what's that going to do to competition and balance in the league? The fourth? 
was the elimination of the waiver system. And the fifth, a new individual contract to protect players, including guarantees of salaries. So some of these have changed, but some of them are still in play. So let's move forward and let's see how this happened. When these demands were made, the owners, they somewhat basically balked at the idea. They said, you're telling me you're not happy enough we're giving you money to play football? Well, you don't like it, you can get out. Not really what I saw, the exact words, but that's basically what they were saying. We hold all the powers still. So you can either play football, or we'll find another person to play football. So they called the players bluff. The players, they would end up having a strike from July 1st to August 10th of that year. They walked out. But they returned back in time for training camp, really not accomplishing anything. So the holdout and the struggle begins. This is going to be a long time, folks. You better dig in. Hope you have a bunch of MREs to hold you over, because this is going to be a long one. There was no traction from 1974, 1975, or 1976 seasons at all. Until 1976, there was a landmark case. Mackey versus the NFL. John Mackey was a tight end for the Baltimore Colts. He challenged the Rizal rule. In this, the 8th Circuit Court out of Minnesota ultimately ruled that Rizal Rule was an unreasonable restraint of trade, citing the Sherman Antitrust Act. Now, this Sherman Antitrust Act, it was passed on July 2nd of 1890. It was the first federal act in an effort to crush monopolistic jerks. This is what the Federal Trade Commission site says about the Antitrust Sherman Act. Congress passed the first antitrust law, the Sherman Act. 1890 as a comprehensive charter of economic liberty aimed at preserving free and unfettered competition as the rule of trade. So many more things would happen from the federal government to help Americans out, just as the NFLPA would need more victories for the players to get us to what the modern era of the NFL free agency is like. But this victory, 1976, it was the foundation, just like that Sherman Antitrust Act. So this victory, the 1976 ruling, was written into the CBA. But it's still, it's still limited free agency. It wiped out the Rizal rule, but the owners, they still had the upper hand. So in 1982, the players were still not too happy about the deal. They would go on a 57-day player strike. Again, owners called their bluff. Basically, what they got out of this was some back pay for the games they didn't play, and they got some better medical coverage, but really not anything for free agency. So it will go on and on and on. Just like that Lieutenant Hiro Inoto over there fighting in the Philippines. Then in 1987, the players took a final stand, or at least that's what they thought. You know, this is their Alamo. It was considered one of the darkest years in NFL history. The scab season. Players sat out after the second week of the league, and they wouldn't play again. Well, 15% of the players, they crossed picket lines. This caused strife amongst the players, the organization, as well as the NFLPA. Because think about it, you know, we're all one team, but then 15% of you are going to go work for the man? You're going to bet against us? That's not cool. So in 1988, the NFLPA, they tried to take the NFL to the courts again. Now the owners won this one, but they were still worried about having to deal with the court a whole bunch more. So they devised a new plan. This was known as Plan B Free Agency. Kind of like, you know, hey, Plan A didn't work, call it audible, let's go Plan B. This would give the owners the option to restrict 37 players, meaning they would be subject to the first refusal compensation system. So basically, it means that only backup special teamers and other guys that you don't really want in your team are going to be the ones that are unrestricted free agents. Again, not what the players wanted. But the NFLPA as a union, they had less power, and they really couldn't sue against the antitrust laws. So players, they decided to decertify individual players of the NFL would sue the NFL for antitrust laws, and they ended up winning it. They won their suit in 1992 because the jury declared that Plan B still violated antitrust laws. And this comes from the Washington Post through the MIT's website. The players prevailed on three of the four questions put to the jury. The jurors ruled that Plan B had a harmful effect on competition, that Plan B was too restrictive, and that the players suffered economic injury as a result. The owners prevailed on the question of how much Plan B contributed to a competitive balance in the NFL. But with that being said, a lawyer from the league in his closing arguments warned that a verdict for the players could mean the destruction of the National Football League as we know it. However, here is a quote from the New York Times back in 1992. 
Each of the eight players testified before the jury, but no owner did. Quinn said in his closing arguments that although several owners, including Kansas City Chiefs Lamar Hunt, the Giants co-owner Wellington Mara, and the Cleveland Browns Art Modell were present for closing arguments that, quote, not one, and what is it, a 40-foot walk up to that stand, got up there because they knew they couldn't possibly defend the system. Okay, so I know this is a heavy and somewhat controversial topic at times, but you got to remember that it's the NFL fan that suffers if there is strife between the league and the players. Now, I love the game, and that's why I'm curious about how the league morphed into what it is today. But I'm going to play a clip for you from a fan's reason why he's a fan of his team. And I'd like to know why you were a fan of your home team. You can send in your clip in various ways. For information on how to submit your clip to the show, head over to myfootballmoment.com. This moment shoots into your ear hole from Jeremy McFarland. Take it away, dude. For years, I have been wanting a football team of my own. When I was younger, I remember watching my first real game. I was a Seahawks fan. And I was like, that's awesome. They have the cool helmets and everything like that. But they got beat in the playoffs. So in the Super Bowl with the Washington Redskins and Denver Broncos, I said, John Elway looks like a good guy. I found my team. I found my Denver Broncos. They were my football team. The problem is I live in Tennessee. It's hard to find any merchandise here in Tennessee that related to the Broncos. So whenever I find it, I would buy it. L.A., I followed him through the highs and lows until he retired after winning two Super Bowls. But then at that time, the Tennessee Titans became a thing. They moved from Houston. They were Tennessee Oilers. Then they became the Titans. And I thought I could find my team now since they were right down the road watching them play, going to several games, going to training camp, going to preseason games, seeing the merchandise. It really got me to the point that I said, this could be my team. This is my team. I would play them on Madden. I would do all these things, and I would be able to say that this is my moment. This is the chance that I can be a fan of a team that could be my own. You know, football is family, and I'm glad that we have the Titans watching from every every person from Steve McNair now to Marcus Mariota, from Eddie George to Derrick Henry and everybody in between having their jerseys, having their likeness on my wall, having their football cards, again, playing them on Madden. It's one of those things that makes it worthwhile to say this is my team. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets about how the NFL got to the point right before modern NFL free agency began. Next week, we're going to finish the fight for the players by taking a look at the class action suit responsible for the modern NFL free agency. And it all revolves around arguably the greatest NFL free agent of all time, Reggie White, the Minister of Defense. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads.